Are you planning a trip to Japan? If so, put cycling the Shimanami Kaido high on your list. This 70km ride connects Honshu to Shikoku via a series of picturesque islands. The journey offers up incredible views, ample opportunities to explore local cuisine and culture, and is safe and well signposted. I had an incredible time doing it. Hi by the way, I'm Camp by Cam, and in this video I'm going to take you through what you need to know and what you can expect on the ride. Let's get to it. The first thing you'll need to decide is which direction you want to do the ride. You can either start in Imabari and end in Onomichi or vice versa. There are minor differences between the two directions. There are greater elevation changes at the end of the ride if you're heading to Imabari for instance, but the payoff is that you end on this spectacular view. Well, not quite end, as chances are you'll probably still need to head into Imabari to drop off your bike. Aye, aye, Imabari. Yep, okay, thanks for that. In any case, if you go in the opposite direction, you'll end your journey with a short ferry ride and find yourself in the relatively small and entirely delightful Onomichi. There's no right direction, but I chose to start in Onomichi and end in Imabari as I wanted to continue on to another destination on Shikoku. Aye, aye, Imabari. Okay, that's enough. The next thing to consider is whether you want to do the ride in a single day or not. It's definitely manageable and can take anywhere from 4 to 5 hours for fast cyclists through to 8 to 10 hours for beginners or slow riders. Personally, I wanted the freedom to stop frequently, to take random detours and to just enjoy myself, so I opted to do it over two days with a night in a hostel at Omishima Island about halfway through the ride. There are plenty of places to stay, but if you want to have your luggage forwarded to you, you'll need to pick hotels, hostels and ryokan that are linked in with the Cycling Without Baggage service. I found it pretty straightforward and was able to get my suitcase sent from Onomichi to Omishima and then on to Imabari without any issues. And at 2,200 yen a pop, I thought it was reasonable value as well. On the other hand, if you're planning on returning to your starting point, you can put your luggage in a locker. I'll include a link with some suggested locker locations in the description, as well as info on the Cycling Without Baggage service. Lastly, you'll also want to consider the time of year you tackle this one. Riding in the summer heat and humidity sounds awful, even with much of the route following coastlines. Winter isn't ideal either, so this is most likely a spring or autumn joint. I went in March, and while I didn't have many clear blue skies, the actual weather for riding was great. Crisp in the mornings, but nice once you get going. In terms of the route, one thing we should cover off before we go any further is that the Shimanami Kaido cycle route is different from the four-lane Shimanami Kaido road. That's officially called the Nishiseto Expressway and is the most direct path across the islands, but also super busy. The expressway and cycle route were developed in tandem and opened in 1999, but the only time you'll be on the same road is when you're in an entirely separate lane while riding across the bridges. Other than that, the cycle route takes a much more scenic path, often winding around coastlines instead of just punching through islands. This means that every bridge has bespoke approaches for bikes, letting them gradually climb to the height of the bridge without the incline getting too steep. There are actually multiple ways to approach the ride. There's a recommended route for cyclists of basically any level, but there are often intermediate and even advanced options too. How you approach the Shimanami Kaido then depends on how fit you are, how much riding experience you have, what bike you'll be using, and how much cycling gear you own. I don't cycle very often, and the bike I rented wasn't really up to the task of dealing with anything too challenging, so for the most part, I stuck to the recommended path with a few detours out of curiosity thrown in. My bike may not have been a precision piece of modern high-tech engineering, but the bike rental prices are pretty good. They're currently 3,000 yen per day for a Mama Chari or a cross bike, 4,000 yen per day for a tandem or electric assist bike, and 8,000 yen per day for an e-bike. Bear in mind, however, that only the 3,000 yen options can be used across multiple days. Everything else is a same-day rental. Whether you need to reserve a bike ahead of time probably depends on when you're doing the ride. You're definitely better off being safe than sorry if you're tackling it on a public holiday or during a busy time of year, but when I went to the rental terminal the day before my ride, they just told me to get there early the next day and I'd be fine. That said, if you're not going through the Shimanami rental cycle service and instead want to get your hands on, say, a proper road bike, you'll 100% want to tee that up in advance. 
Again, it all depends on your experience level and expectations. I found the basic cross bike perfectly fine for the entirety of the recommended route, and it was also good knowing that if anything went wrong, I could call Shimanami Japan or visit one of the bike terminals for help. A company called Waka also offers both a roadside repair service and taxi pickup. One other thing to know, there are more than 200 cycle oasis stops along the route. While they vary in terms of services, the basic idea is that you can use them to take a break, refill your water bottles and use pumps if necessary. Oh, and be sure to bring plenty of cash. You can pay for lots of stuff with cards in the big Japanese cities, but out on this course, cash is still king. With all that out of the way, let's start the journey. I picked up my bike from the Renda Cycle Terminal at Onomichi Port when it opened, which was 7am March to November and 8am December to February. From there, it's a short ride to get the ferry across the water to Mukaishima Island to start the ride proper. The ferry costs 100 yen and you pay on board. Once off, you'll be introduced to one of the greatest features of the Shimanami Kaido cycle route, the Blue Line. Yes, if you're taking the recommended route, all you have to do is follow the blue line and it'll take you all the way from Honshu to Shikoku or vice versa. No stopping to check maps or phones, just follow the line. The journey starts out along relatively urban streets, but it's not too long before you're beside the water and going under the bright red Mukaishima Bridge, which leads to Awashi Island. Beyond that, you get a look at the first of six bridges you're set to ride across. Inoshima Bridge is 1.27 kilometers long and takes you to Inoshima Island. To get onto the bridge, you actually need to go under it and then loop back around. This will become a familiar part of this cycle, starting at sea level and steadily climbing along narrow bike paths until you're at the level of the bridge, or close to it in this case, as the bike and pedestrian path across Inoshima Bridge is actually beneath the expressway for other vehicles. This means your view is curtailed somewhat, but it also makes it nice and leisurely to cross. Coming back down on the other side, you'll soon see the Inoshima Amenity Park and its star attraction. Meet Zaru-kun. Why is there a large, presumably albino dinosaur here? I couldn't find an adequate explanation online, but who am I to judge? I live in a country that seems to think that random big things are the premier tourist destination. Still, it'd be nice if it was a bit more realistic. These should all have feathers, right? The park also has a playground, pool and beach, and if you backtrack towards the bridge a bit, you can pop into Hasakuya. It's named after the citrus fruit Hasaku, which was developed in Inoshima, and the shop sells mochi with pieces of Hasaku inside, as well as a range of other sweet treats. And speaking of Hasaku, this is Hasakun, the inevitable mascot based on said citrus. Honestly, no other country churns out mascots with anywhere near the efficiency or ingenuity of Japan. I mean, check out Tsukimamori, a JR West mascot slash monster that lurks in the gap between the train and platform waiting for kids who don't mind the gap and fall down. What happens then? I hate to think. Oh, wait, it's friendly. Of course it is. In fact, apparently it dances when it's happy, likes to play hide and seek, and is free-spirited, whimsical, and moody. Created to raise awareness of the dangers of kids falling in train station gaps, this mascot is classic Japan. This is a country that's both extremely worried about people hurting themselves and absolutely fantastic at making characters and merch out of just about anything. The recommended route on Inoshima Island takes you through its northern end. And this is mostly suburban, but pocked with gardens and greenhouses, and with some pretty backdrops thanks to the mountains in the distance. One of these mountains, Shirataki, has 700 Buddha statues at its summit, and commanding 360 degree views of the region, including Ikuchi Island and the impressive bridge leading across to it. Getting up there on the bike definitely falls into the advanced category, but you could potentially leave it chained up somewhere below and walk up. As a quick aside, Hiroshima is famous for its okonomiyaki, so it's no surprise Inoshima has its own spin on the classic dish. Known as Inoko, a combination of Inoshima and okonomiyaki, it uses udon noodles instead of soba. Before long, you'll be riding along the coast again with the next bridge in sight. But it's here that the traffic steps up and things get a whole lot busier. 
On the plus side, there are three or four combinis in a short stretch, so if you're running dangerously low on Fami Chickies, this may be a good point on the trip to stop for a snack and drink, or just to stock up on supplies. Once again, as you approach Akuchi Bridge, you'll go under it, then loop back for the climb up. Be sure to keep an eye out for the sign to turn off, as it's easy to miss and you'll suddenly wonder where the blue line went. Just like this. There's a nice rest area on the ascent with fantastic views across to the bridge in Akuchi Island, as well as off the water and Iwagi Island in the distance. The impressive cable-stayed Ikuchi Bridge is one of the shorter bridges on the ride, only 790 metres long, and unlike Inoshima Bridge, you're on the same level as the traffic, but with your own section of the road. Once you reach its end, there's a great cruise down a winding path to reach the cycle route once again. These descents after each bridge came to be one of my favourite parts of moving from island to island. The recommended path through Ikuchi Island follows the coast north and stays on or close to the coast the whole way. This island is dense with citrus and lemon orchards to the point that it's known as Lemon Island and is unsurprisingly also chock full of shops selling lemons and lemon related products. You know the old saying, when life hands you lemons, name your island after them and also make a commemorative venture or two. Staying on the subject of the local lemons, there's a gelato factory and cafe called Seto da Dolce on the way, so I stopped off for a fantastically zippy and fresh lemon gelato. According to the shop's website, translated by Google I might add, so let's take it with a grain of salt, Dolce's special citrus is grown with love by Mr. Marino, a citrus craftsman from Seto da. The taste and credibility are the highest grade citrus sold in department stores. I kind of wish I'd become a citrus craftsman now, instead of an amateur sake taster. Although, I guess we both have a commitment to deliciousness. The island of Ikuchi is actually one of the most popular tourist destinations of the ride, and the small town of Setoda, which is a little further along the northern shore from Dolce Gelato, has a number of attractions. Ko Sanji is one of the most notable and consists of a temple complex, museum, and sculptural garden made from marble called the Hill of Hope, among other things. At 1400 yen to enter, it was a bit rich for my tastes, and it's also worth pointing out that Korsanji is pretty modern. The temple is from the 1930s onwards, while the Hill of Hope opened in the year 2000. Even so, it's a good option. There's also the Hirayama Ikuo Museum of Art, named after and dedicated to the work of the famous contemporary painter. Hirayama is perhaps best known for his pieces inspired by the Silk Road, but for Shimanami cyclists, the museum also hosts a collection called 53 Stages on the Shimanami Highway, which includes 60 watercolour drawings and three paintings showcasing sights along the route. Entry to the museum is 1,000 yen for adults. I also climbed a hill to reach the three-storey pagoda of Kokoji Temple. This national treasure is a hugely impressive structure and dates back to the 15th century. You also get a nice outlook over the distant mountains and nearby port. By this point, I'd built up quite an appetite, so I headed to Shiomachi Shotengai, or Shiomachi Shopping Street, to see what was on offer. Despite some nice looking restaurants and cafes, I ultimately couldn't resist the lure of Matsushige Liquor Shop. After all, what better combination could there be than a booze emporium that also serves up Hiroshima style okonomiyaki? And it turned out to be a great choice, with a super friendly owner, bizarre and quirky decor, and food that was both delicious and incredible value. I'll drop the website link and Google map location in the description if you're keen to check it out. Once my hunger was sated, I explored the immediate area a little, discovering, as is the way in Japan, a shrine and a couple of temples, then continued on my way. The recommended path takes you from Setoda Port down the island's western edge to Tatara Bridge, which then leads to Omishima Island. Tatara Bridge is like the big brother of Akuchi Bridge and is almost twice as long, coming in at 1.48 kilometers. It also marks the point on the ride that you cross over from Hiroshima Prefecture and into Ehime Prefecture. That happens right about here. Ordinarily, you'd come down off the bridge and head south, but my accommodation for the night was just to the north, so I looped around in that direction. Where did I stay? Eilink Hostel and Cafe. The facilities are modern and clean, and you can choose between lobbing your bike in the undercover shed outside, or simply chucking it on the wall of your room. On top of that, there's a family mart across the road, and a bathhouse just down the street. Let's quickly talk about said bathhouse. It's in this funky building, the Shimanami Dome, which also houses a swimming pool, gym, and basketball court. 
The bathing facilities feel like an old school Sento, with one large hot bath inside divided into two sections. One side has a series of jets to massage your back, the other a step to sit on. There's also a small sauna with wooden seats and no mats, as well as a cold bath, which wasn't quite cold enough. Outside, there's a tiny patio area with another bath. If you stand up, you have a great view of the nearby bridge, mountain range and water, but as soon as you sit down for a soak, you can only see the very top of the bridge, somewhat defeating the purpose of having an outdoor area. Still, for 420 yen admission and 30 yen for soap, it's not a bad deal. Be sure to bring your own towel though. After my soak, I grabbed a meal at the hostel and sampled some local sake and called it a night. Oya sumina sai. Omishima is easily the largest of the islands that the Shimanami Kaido goes through, but the recommended path barely touches it. If you've got the time and a good enough bike, you may be interested in taking one of the routes around the outside of the island. If you follow the intermediate path to the north, you can actually get a ferry from Sakari Port to Okonoshima, aka Rabbit Island. This diminutive destination has literally hundreds of rabbits roaming around, making it a particularly cute place to visit with kids. Mind you, it does have a messed up past, as Okonoshima was the centre of Japan's chemical weapons research and production during World War II, and at that time was erased from the map entirely. There's now a poison gas museum you can visit, as well as other remnants of the island's dark past. Speaking of remnants, the official website says that the rabbits may have been introduced in the aftermath of World War II in order to identify poison gas leaks, canary in a coal mine style. In any case, along with feeding rabbits, you can also walk around the island's 4 km circumference, hike up to the observation platform at its centre, or have a swim if the weather's warm enough. Returning to Omishima Island, the advanced path along the southern coast is meant to offer some incredible views, with even the Kurashima Kaikyo bridges and Imabari visible on clear days. Aye, aye. Nope. It's a long path, but you're riding beside picturesque citrus orchards and the road is reportedly good, with hills that are steady as opposed to steep. Alongside a handful of modern art and architecture museums, the Oyamazumi Shrine, nestled beneath Mount Washigato, is a key attraction of the island, as it has one of the world's greatest collections of samurai armour and swords. Why? Well, according to the Shimanami Japan website, it was one of the most important shrines in the country for centuries. It was so notable that high-ranking samurai would come to Oyamazumi to pray for success in battle. If they proved victorious, they would then return and offer their armour and weapons to the shrine, hence the incredible collection. The shrine also has a sacred tree in front of the main hall that's over 2,600 years old. Legend has it that if you complete three laps around the tree while holding your breath, your wish will come true. I really hope the samurai captains did this too, but somehow I doubt it. The Oyamazumi Shrine can be reached by either of the paths around the outside of the island, but also via the route that cuts straight through to Miyauro Port. If you're just following the recommended route, on the other hand, one thing to look out for is the Amazaki Castle Ruins on Kojo Island, which are all that's left of a castle complex that was here from the Sengoku period, or Warring States period, through to the early Edo. Nowadays, only some remnants of the stone walls remain. There's also plenty to discover if you want to take small detours, but the recommended path very quickly reaches the shortest bridge of them all and takes you onto Hakata. This island has a number of attractions such as beaches, views and shrines, but I decided to go under the next bridge and follow the intermediate path to reach the Funaori Seto Strait Stunning Deck, as it's labelled on the official map. Before that however, there are shrines to detour by and a good cycling rest stop just next to Hakata Beach. With its palm trees, sandy shore and view of the next bridge, it's the ideal spot to grab a coffee in a can or a bottle of water and to chill out for a bit. Moving on, I soon reached the observation deck and it was well worth the journey with a fantastic view to nearby Ushima Island and across to Oshima. And have a look at how strong the current is. The sign as I came off the bridge described this as a whirling tidal current and one of nature's mysteries. There were some nice views of the Hakata Oshima bridge as I headed back towards it and it wasn't long until I was on the bridge itself enjoying how open it is. Just over a kilometre cycling later and I was onto the last island on the Shimanami Kaido, Oshima. 
Oshima's recommended path starts out along the coast, and it was on this stretch that I decided lunch was in order, so popped into a completely random restaurant by the water for some yakitori. I then detoured to visit Ebisu, the god of fishermen and delicious beer, at Miyakubo port, then doubled back to follow the route inland. As much as I love cycling beside the water, this next section was incredibly picturesque, with gorgeous traditional houses at the base of rocky, heavily forested mountains dotted with cherry trees. I found myself turning off the main road a few times just to ride through small towns to soak up the atmosphere. The recommended route through Oshima includes two long climbs, so it can be a challenging way to end the ride for some. The alternative is to take the intermediate path along the western coast for a much longer but steadier cycle. On the other hand, those who want to really push themselves can branch off from the recommended path for a gruelling 3.5km ride to the top of Mount Kiro. The reward for doing this is one of the best views on the entire Shimanami Kaido. All good things must come to an end, however, and it's not long before the final set of bridges is in sight. And boy, are these impressive. The Kurashima Kaiko bridges are the world's longest series of suspension bridges, more than four kilometers to traverse, with numerous small islands beneath and nearby as you ride. When you come to the end of the bridges, you should detour to the right and visit the Kurashima Strait Observatory for absolutely epic views back across the bridges to Omashima, as well as of the various nearby islands. The Itoyama Observatory is also super close, with a higher viewing platform and great vista that even lets you see the cyclists coming off the bridges and looping around as they descend. From here, it's actually possible to drop your bike off at the nearby Sunrise Itoyama, these are machines, machines for, for weaving kimono. No, this is a vehicle called a bicycle. You can ride it all over the Shimanami. It's fantastic. Oh. But I was staying the night in Imabari, so rode into the city to the rental bike terminal at JR Imabari Station. Imabari is a biggish city, so this part of the journey was very busy and very urban. And in fact, it was the only time in the two days of cycling that I rode on the footpath to get away from the traffic. In any case, drop-off was simplicity itself, and I was soon free to soothe my slightly fatigued muscles at a bathhouse. Located only a couple of blocks away was Kisuke no Yu, an onsen as well as capsule hotel that very much caters to Shimanami Kaido riders. Using the onsen costs between 650 and 750 yen depending on when you go, or you can pay around double that to also access the rest area, bedrock bath, and for all you can drink coffee. I paid to use the onsen only and it was great, with plenty of options. There are tons of different types of bays with jets to massage your muscles, a large carbonated bath with denki buru or electric bath bays, watch my onsen etiquette video for more on those, a walking bath that's reputed to be good for rehabilitation, a semi-open air alkaline rock bath where I spent some time watching sumo wrestling on TV, a bath for kids filled with rubber duckies, and a shower bucket that lets you pull a cord and dump water on yourself. It also has a good sized sauna and a tiny wet sauna that's only big enough for four and has chill atmospheric music. Oh, and a large cold bath. The women's area also has a jade bath using soft water that supposedly has a moisturizing effect on the skin. According to the Google translation of the website, this bath will let you feel the power of jade, which has a powerful healing effect that is said to stabilize the mind. Hmm. The bathing area was pretty packed when I was there, but it was still well worth visiting. The art on the walls is an awesome touch too. Whether you're in the men's section with its Edo meets the modern era on the Shimanami Kaido vibe, or in the women's with its tale of a girl riding the Shimanami Kaido to deliver mandarins to mermaids, kappa and celestial maidens. After my soak, I grabbed a cheap and cheerful bowl of udon in the restaurant and set off to find my accommodation for the night, a ryokan over near the ferry terminal. To say it was old school would be a massive understatement, but hey, it certainly had personality. So that was my experience cycling the Shimanami Kaido. It was an awesome couple of days, and I hope this video inspires you to hop on a bike and do the same the next time you're in Japan. Please give the vid a like and subscribe to the channel, and stay tuned for more recommendations for hikes and day trips in the land of the rising fun. And I'll leave you with more Mascot Madness.